talky And on lots of pucks to be flung Chris Baker is always watching And in the bunker he's having fun Oh no, we're gonna skate down to Prospect Avenue Get info you require Oh, we're gonna skate down to Prospect Avenue Your hockey news supplier Welcome back to Prospect Avenue. Chris Baker here in the bunker, September 1st, 2023. It is the beginning officially of Sabres prospect season. While preseason action has been happening for the past few weeks in Europe, Champions League play did begin this week with Noah Ostlin and Vekwa in action. They earned a convincing 5-1 victory over the Lati Pelicans of Liga. And then just today, Seska began their Gagarin Cup defense with their uh, KHL season opener, a loss to Kazan, the team who they beat for the Cup just a few short months ago. We'll get into uh, Poltapov's game and, and some expectations for him as well this season in a little bit here, because I think today, probably prudent to do a European prospects preview. I mean, I have to start reprogramming my brain for hockey. It's been a fun summer. It's been a uh, productive summer. Um, had a lot of fun. We're squeezing every ounce we can out of that bottle. But the reality is that hockey season is here. And while I know there's a few weeks left on the calendar for summer that I hope you're all able to enjoy here, and hopefully you guys can continue to enjoy your lives in the uh, fall and through the winter. I will be here in this office. And that's that reality of that is crashing down here on me uh, presently. But no, it's all good. I like doing what I do. But no, the reality is that hockey season is here. And I think it's time. I have to get back into hockey mode. And we're going to start by doing this. It's been a few weeks since we've gotten together here on YouTube or on your favorite audio platform. If that's how you consume this podcast. And we're going to get right into rhythm here. So today we'll talk about some of the Sabres European prospects that they have developing abroad this season. It's a uh, pretty important year for a lot of these guys. And I think the most prudent place to start is actually with uh, Topias Leinonen, because there was news this week with Leinonen that, um, well, first of all, Uvescula had to go out and sign a veteran goaltender this week to stop a gap here because Leinonen's going to be down on the shelf for about six weeks due to an injury. And what we're hearing, uh, you know, from sources overseas that are a little close to the situation with Leinonen is that this sounds like a flare up of that same, we'll call it lower leg stress fracture, heel, ankle, um, that kept him off the ice at Sabres development cap, kept him off the ice at the World Junior Summer Showcase in July in Plymouth, Michigan. Kept him off the ice just last week for the Under-25 Nations event where Finland brought a team to continue their evaluation uh, to start building their roster for this winter's World Junior Championship. And it's kind of a bummer for Lane and in, um, you know, because he elected to go back and play in JYP this year in Liga think that if the Sabres had their druthers, they would have liked to have had him come over and maybe play in the CHL this year and kind of repeat the success and, um, you know, just get a lot of action, kind of like Uko Pekka Lukanen did a few years ago when he left Finland, came over to Sudbury, got a lot of starts, got some playoff action, became a top performer in the Ontario League, won some some awards that year and just served in a, a nice springboard into his North American professional career. But with Lane and staying back, um, you know, not a terrible situation for him to be in with Uvescula this year. You know, this was a club that had huge expectations last year and was pretty much a massive disappointment finishing 13th in the league. They had five different goalies, take the net last year until Vaini Vavalainen came in and asserted himself as a clear-cut number one. 
Uh, Vava Lainen came back this year and was going to form a tandem and seemed to have things steady there with Vava Lainen and Lainen and in net. But Lainen was going to have to fight his way to starts with the established number one in front of him. And now he's going to be down for six weeks. Um, so that kind of sets him back. I mean, this is kind of an important year, you know, coming off uh, a 2022, 2023 season where, you know, it was up and down for him. He bounced around for, uh, to a few different clubs, um, had some highs, had some lows. And this was a year where you really were hoping that he'd get off to a good start, could start, um, you know, getting the net more often. And now he's just going to be behind the eight ball a little bit, both in terms of winning more starts with his Liga club, but also keeping himself firmly in the mix for the world junior championship this winter with him missing the world junior summer showcase and the under 18, uh, the under 25 nations that just happened, you know, that created an opportunity for other 18 and 19 year olds to uh, show what they can do and, and get themselves squarely in the mix with Lane in when he returns. So now it's going to be a little tricky, you know, hopefully he can kind of stay sharp, you know, Lane in at an age where he has to, you know, really take it seriously, you know, pr- practice good sleep habits, good nutrition. Hopefully he's able to do some, um, you know, some work while he's off the ice, you know, eye training, maybe it's virtual reality training to build out his puck tracking skill set. But, um, you know, we'll be monitoring what happens with Lane in here, but it seems like, you know, mid October is kind of the timeline barring no setbacks, but definitely a bummer. Um, you know, JYP, Coming into the year, plus 1,000 on the European odds boards. You know, so those higher expectations from last year have been a little tempered. You know, they're set to be a middle-of-the-pack team. But needless to say, um, you know, when Lainanen does come back, I don't know if the plan's going to be for him to see some under-20 league starts and then, you know, get some momentum and confidence going before they bring him back up to Liga, or are they just going to throw him right into the mix and give him some starts? Uh, after some practices at the top league level. We'll wait and see on that. But, uh, you know, again, kind of a tough one here with Lane and in. Wish him the best on the road to recovery, and we will be keeping track of the situation, and you can check back here for further updates as they become available. To keep the train moving along with this European prospect preview, we're going to hop over to Russia and talk a little bit about Prokhor Poltapov. Uh, a player I really like, Um, you know, whether it's previous summer podcasts, I may have mentioned my affinity for his game as a, you know, a a, a forward that has a well-rounded skill set. He's got nice offensive traits to his game, good shooter, um, good passing skills, very good skater, uh, takes the puck hard to the net. He's not afraid to go to the net with or without the puck. He's a good four checker. I just like his game. I think that he brings a lot to the middle of a lineup. And he's coming back to Seska this year. Again, they're amongst the league favorites to win the Gagarin Cup. Last year, pulled top off. If you, if you look at the timeline, really from the past 12 months with him, you know, it was September 1, 2022, when the KHL season began last year. And pulled top off was starting on Seska's second line, uh, a line centered by Vlad Kamenev, who has an NHL pedigree. And that experiment didn't last very long. I think it was the first game of the season, actually, where Poltov was just absolutely juiced up, had a lot of energy, got a little excited, you know, entered the left wing corner and launched himself into a high hit, made co- uh, head contact. And before you know it, he was tossed from the game, racked up 25 minutes and penalties. And then from there, you know, kind of started to lose his standing in that top six. That experiment with him up with Kamenev only lasted about a week and a half. And then he was dispatched right down to the fourth line for the most part for the entire regular season en route to uh, picking up five goals and five assists and averaging just a little over eight minutes a game last season. And he held that position in that fourth line role right up until the final playoff series in the championship round against Kazan, where he went from, you know, an eight minute a night player to picking up over 11 minutes a game in five of his last six appearances in that championship series, played a more important role for Sergei Fedorov's club in that series. And you were hoping that maybe that served as a springboard coming into this season where he came into camp as the second youngest player. You know, this is a veteran team. You know, you have names like, um, 
you know, Mikhail Grigorenko, and I talked about Kamenev already, and Plotnikov, and Abramov, and Akulov, and Svetlikov. They got a lot of forwards on their roster that are very well established and were big time contributors to their KHL championship win last season. But you were hoping that um, if you looked at how Sergei Fedorov saw Poltapov fitting into the lineup at the beginning of last year, that maybe, you know, and how he ended the season that he would, again, maybe be given an opportunity to play up the lineup very early on, but it doesn't appear the case to be the case. Um, started the season today on the fourth line, played about eight and a half minutes. And, um, you know, we saw him do some good things today, though. I actually have uh, part of a shift that I'll dial up here, and we can take a look at some of the work that he did in today's game. Um, you know, at his best, he's good on the boards, and very strong beneath the goal line. And we saw a little bit of that today. So I'm going to pop up this for those that are watching on YouTube. This is just a short clip of one of his shifts today. And Poltapa is wearing 13 in the dark jerseys here. So you'll see him emerge here coming off the bench. At your top of your screen, puck comes into the zone. And here comes Poltapa into the corner. Squeezes past the check. Controls the puck beneath the goal line. Fights off a check. Right to the net. Okay. Creates a little chaos there around the net. Now, Kazan brings the puck out, but we're going to keep this rolling. <clears throat> now, here comes Poltapov down the right wing boards. Okay, chips, charges. Okay, he's going to get the puck deep here. Again, squeezes through a check, takes it around the net, puts it through the triangle. And this actually, this pressure here from Poltapov leads to a cross check on one of his line mates, and Seska gets a penalty. So, that was a, uh, that's like, that's kind of pulled top of right now at his best when, you know, he kind of keeps it simple in that role that he's in, creates a lot of opportunities for himself, as you saw right there. But that was um, just one shift of 12 that pulled top off had today. And again, I think the idea is for him moving forward to just kind of work his way up the lineup as he goes. Um, He's certainly capable of playing more than eight and a half minutes a game. But again, it's a loaded lineup. A lot of veterans, like I said. And I think Sergei Fedorov understands that he has Poltapov this season and next. So it's a two-year plan. And through time, they'll start breaking off chunks of responsibility for him as they go. But again, I can't stress enough. It's a player I like. I think he's developing nicely under the tutelage of Fedorov and his staff there. Certainly since he's been drafted, he's become a more effective player away from the puck into the defensive zone. We saw some moments today where he could make some better decisions, but nothing where he costed his team um, a, a, of any significance. So, you know, for him this year, coming off a season where he played 55 games last year and he had five goals and 10 points, it's a 68 game regular season in the KHL this year. And I think for Poltapov, if he can get to that 10 goal threshold, and that's a good number for a player his age, I think, uh, you know, the Sabres organization would be very happy with the development cycle of a player they took with the first pick of the second round back in 2021. So that's a little bit on pull top off. And we're just going to kind of keep cruising here. Uh, we'll shift to Sweden now and get into Noah Ostland, who again, this season, uh, moving to a new club, Vekwa plus 500 favorites to win the SHL this year, plus 500 favorites to win the Champions League. So if you look at Oslin, and I tweeted this thought this week, there's going to be a spotlight on this player as a talented, highly regarded player. Remember, he's one of those 2022 first-round draft triplets that the Sabres had with Savoy and Kulik. Very talented playmaker, plays fast, thinks the game fast, um, He's a step ahead of the play. He anticipates really well, good technical skills defensively with the stick supporting the zone. But we like how he adds motion and just the way that he could snap that puck around the offensive zone. He truly is a point guard out there, kind of like how, um, you know, you have your ball distributor on the basketball court. That's kind of one of those analogies that I make with Ostlin. But new player in a new system on one of the best teams in Europe. That's the story here with Ostlin and what we saw him do in his first game, if it's any indication for how a season sets up, he's going to be in pretty good position here to have a nice year. Now, he didn't have any points in the 5-1 win over Lati this week in the Champions League opener, but he did lead the team with over 20 minutes of ice time. And, you know, if you look back last year, he played 37 games for Garden in Hockey Allsvenskan, 
and picked up eight goals and 26 points and average just under 17 minutes per game. So again, if he opened up with 20 minutes, you know, and, and I don't think it's realistic to think he's going to get 20 minutes every game, but I think the expectation here for Oslin as it relates to the SHL is that, um, you know, you want to see him play a major role. So again, if he was second line center and got some power play time in the opener, that's great. That it's uh, that implies that he's going to have definitely a bump a nice time this year over that, um, 1648, I think his average was last season with your garden. And, you know, it's just going to imply that he got key developmental minutes. That's what you want. I think a baseline for Oslin this year, really this year is all about getting, uh, bigger and stronger. You want to see him stay healthy first and foremost. And, you know, I think from a statistical standpoint, if he can get to that 35 point threshold, that's a good number for him this year, keeping in mind that he's going to miss about a month, but in reality, you know, during that month for world juniors, you know, they have a, um, international break baked in there. They have a, a brief holiday break. He'll probably miss about six games. So 35 point threshold would put him at about 0.75 points per game. I think that would be a really good number for him to, uh, achieve if he can get there. Great. But there's another big kind of milestone for his season. And that's the World Junior Championship. Oslin is uh, going to be coming back, and he's going to play a key role for Team Sweden this year. Sweden knows what they have with uh, Oslin, as well as Jonathan Lekermaki and Liam Ogren, his former Jurgarden junior line mates. I think they're probably going to be put together as a top line again this winter for the World Juniors. Sweden didn't even take that trio to the World Junior Summer Showcase this year uh, because they're locks to make the team. They know what they have in those three players, leaving them off that roster. You now, keep in mind, did, you know, like the uh, injury that Oslin was recovering from over the summer contribute to him not going? Maybe a smidge, but even if he was healthy, I can, I, I imagine he wouldn't have been there because they wanted to have an opportunity to evaluate other players like an Anton Wahlberg, for example, and we'll get into him. But this is a, um, you know, a big year for Oslin as he gets ready to make the leap to the AHL in 2024, 25. And I think him being part of Vequa and that really strong system um, will serve him well this year. So let's get to Wahlberg here uh, playing in Malmo this year, along with a uh, fellow Sabres prospect, William von Barnikow, who will, we'll get to in a second, uh, maybe in less detail, but Wahlberg uh, and Malmo, it's an interesting situation because if we talk about Vequa being the odds on favorite to win the SHL at the bottom of the board is Malmo at plus 5,000. So Red Hawks expected to have another tough year, but this should present uh, itself as a developmental opportunity for Anton Wahlberg, especially if his preseason deployment is any indication. Now keep in mind teams, you know, they're always shuffling lines in preseason and it's not always indicative of what the future is going to look like. But if we go by preseason, you know, he's played three games thus far, started off as a second line winger, moved up to the first line for the second preseason game. And then he was given a night off a rest day, then came back today and played on the third line in an exhibition against a Norwegian club on the same line with William von Barnico. Now I'm focused on that second preseason game. Uh, because I think it kind of gives you insight into what the coaching staff sees for Wahlberg moving forward. And that was where they put him with two critical acquisitions that Malmo went out and made this year, picking up a pair of highly offensive Finnish forwards in Yanni Kukinen, a 2016 NHL draft pick picked in the second round and, and along the way at 25 years of age comes to Malmo with 119 games of NHL experience. And they also had um, opposite Wahlberg's wing was Laurie Paginiemi, a, a New York Rangers pick in 2018, who spent a couple of years with the Hartford Wolfpack in the AHL and picked up 68 points over the course of the last two seasons there. If you're looking at Wahlberg being put up there, I think they want to make sure that he can handle that role, you know, because when you're with players of that caliber, you're going to be out in all situations. Um didn't pick up any points in that game, but it's not a big deal. But more importantly, you know, he, he hung with them, you know, on the breakouts and 
He showed that his size and he has long reach and he's disruptive and he can play really big beneath the goal line and be a presence in front of the net. Those are characteristics that lend well with two very creative playmakers like those Finnish line mates. Not a formal prediction um, that Wahlberg will stick on that top line, but I can definitely see him being a legitimate top six forward in the SHL this year. And that's only going to help his case in his efforts to make Team Sweden for the World Junior Championship. If we go back and we look at what Wahlberg did over the summer, even go back to last year, actually, when he came up late in the year and he played 17 games in the SHL, picked up two goals, two assists, and then in the playoffs was a big-time producer out there in critical moments and helped Malmo stave off relegation to stay in the SHL. So, you know, they have that snapshot of his play last year in some high-pressure moments, and then this year they're already putting him up and giving him looks in their top six. I think that kind of tells you how they want to use him this year And I think he's done a decent job right now in the limited action that I've seen in preseason where he's acquitted himself and he's proven to the coaching staff that he can earn those big minutes in that role. Certainly more than the nine minutes that he averaged in 17 games last year as a 17 year old. You got to remember Anton Wahlberg did not turn 18 till after the draft turned 18 July 4th while he was in Buffalo development camp. So that's the SHL part. I think with world juniors, it's going to be pretty compelling because He was paired early in the World Junior Summer Showcase with guys that should be considered locks. And then as Sweden tried to shuffle some lines and look at some different combinations, you started to get the feeling that, you know, his ice time went down as the week played on. And, you know, I think he left that week in position, certainly in the hunt, to be a 9 through 13 forward. But he's not a lock. He has to get off to a good start this year and then really come in like gangbusters, I think, and be that big, hard-to-play-against presence. I don't think Sweden is going to build this crazy all-star team with you know, 12, 13 forwards that are all just creative, flashy playmakers. I think they want to have a mix of size and talent. And Wahlberg could be a really good fit in the second half of that forward group as one of the younger players on the team. Again, getting off to a good start with Malmo in a situation where he's going to be pressed to play, you know, they're going to be overmatched a lot of, a lot of nights. They're going to have to work to get a point every time they take the ice. That's only going to make him a better player. That's why I think it's a developmental opportunity. And he's got that mindset to really take the ball and run with it here and have a pretty decent season. I don't really want to throw out too many statistical predictions other than I think it's safe to say he's going to build upon the two goals and four assists that he had in those 17 games last season. The next group of Swedish prospects that I want to talk about, they're kind of in that never say never zone. You know, they're late round draft picks. They certainly have a shot at an NHL contract, but they're going to need to eventually provide more offensive pop here in this, you know, this season and next to really firm up their place on the radar to get that contract consideration. You know, the Sabres hold these players' rights for four years. They're going to use all four years to evaluate them. But the reality is that the Sabres have a lot of forward talent. They are loaded up front in recent draft picks and young players that are already under contract. So at some point, these players are really going to have to stand out. And the biggest, best way for them to do so is start producing more offense than they have in previous years. I'm in that never say never mode with a lot of these guys because we just saw Philip Cedarquist do it. You know, Cedarquist, his first post draft year bounced around between three different organizations. That second year, he played for two different organizations, spent the majority of the year in hockey, Elsvenskin, showed flashes in those first two years of being that bowl on skates that was just a load in that 15 foot radius around the net was a downhill player, kind of like that moose. That's his nickname. We saw flashes of it. But then in that third year, when he went to your garden in the SHL, he popped. He had a really good year. He scored 14 goals, had you know over 25 points. And that's what got him that look, was that third year of him popping and jumping out and got firmly on the radar for a contract. So again, never say never, whether it's, whether it's William Von Parnikau, who we're going to talk about, Lena Shodin, all these guys. And we'll get to all of them here. Uh, starting with William von Barnico. So, you know, just real quick, won't spend a ton of time on von Barnico. Um, if you go back, this is a player that was developing as kind of a two-way workhorse, can be a little bit, you know, function in a shutdown role. 
He's built like Wahlberg at six foot four. He's got that long reach, long stick, long legs, um, you know, covers a lot of ground in the defensive zone with his big stick and his reach. And he can capitalize when given offensive opportunities. Von Barnikow did score four goals in 37 games last year, averaged nine minutes a night. You know, so he got decent ice time in that lower line role. And that's lower line role is kind of where he looks to be again this year. The expectations that he'll be, you know, third, fourth liner, play some center, play some wing. Um, but that's his projection. You know, he's a late round pick, a sixth rounder. And if he can pop, you know, if he can start producing some offense in the next two years, he can put himself on the map as a potential role player down the line if he wants to pursue a North American career. But where I see Anton Wahlberg up top, I definitely see firmly William von Barnikow on the bottom half to start the year. But again, on that lineup, uh, being a young player, if he starts doing good things, he can stay healthy. He can move up and and be you know a second line player potentially at some point when given that opportunity. But those are some of the expectations there. I think you're looking at you know a guy who's going to pl- be more of a role player this year for Malmo and help shut it down, especially late in games. The next player that I want to talk about staying in the SHL is Linus Shodin from Rogla. Rogla looking at, uh, you know, probably going to be like a middle of the pack team in the SHL this year. I think they have like the fifth or sixth best odds at plus 1000. Uh, all last year, Shodin was a bottom line fixture, mostly on the fourth line. He was pretty much on the fourth line all year, scored one goal, added six assists. He's a reliable, responsible player for sure. You have to be in that mold to play in Sweden's top league at such a young age, like he did two years ago. And, you know, we've seen him be a playmaker and someone that can score clutch goals when he's at, at it, playing against his peer group. Uh, if you go back to two world juniors ago, you know, he scored some nice goals in that tournament, showed some really good passing ability and was very, he had a mature game. Um, very straight ahead, kept his game in straight lines, but was very responsible off the puck. That's the type of player that he is. But, you know, again, you know, for a late round pick, he was a seventh rounder in 2022. You know, they got to stand out, got to do more. These are the the pool of players, those late round draft picks that, you know, they're not only being evaluated against the fellow Sabres prospects that are already drafted, but this is where you get into that territory where a player like Shodin, when decision time is being made on him, is also being evaluated against college free agents, CHL free agents, and whatnot. So while he's responsible, you want to see more offensive consistency and that ability to put up more points at his current level. Even as a young player, you want to see a little bit more from him. And uh, that's job one for him this year. But I like the player, and I just think he needs to pop a little more uh, offense on the board this season to start uh, standing out and emerging as a legitimate candidate for a contract look down the line staying in Sweden here and just checking the time we're closing in on uh, nearly a half an hour. I think we're making good time here because I don't want to be here all night and bore you guys. It's summer. You guys have a life uh, that you want to get out and enjoy, but um, moving on to hockey, all Svenskin and we'll talk about Albert Lacassen, an offensive minded right shot defenseman Lacassen moving back to Carl Skoga this year. And he's firmly in place as a middle pair defenseman at that level, you know, looks to average, you know, 18 and a half, 19 minutes a night. And, you know, we'll definitely get some uh, sweetener with some number one power play time. That's his role. You know, he's not a big shutdown defender. He's more of a, you know, zone area defender. He's good with a stick. He needs to start, you know, winning more one-on-one battles consistently. But, you know, he makes his mark by being an excellent skater and a puck distributor. He gets a lot of shots off on that, and he's very good on the power play. So he's a mobile, offensive-minded defenseman. But as a former seventh rounder, this is the talk track for all these guys. You want to start seeing maybe a couple more goals if possible, but really more assists, generate more offense. Carl Skuga is plus 2,500. So again, a middle of the pack club in hockey all Svenskin this year. They're certainly not at the bottom of the betting board. They'll have an opportunity um, to do well this year. And Lacasse could be a guy that can hopefully take him to the next level. If he can really get that offensive drive train humming on a consistent basis every night, he's got that right shot working for him. He doesn't have a ton of size. 
He's in that five eleven and a half, six foot range. And um, so again, a guy like that is going to be offensive production while staying level on the plus minus or the expected goals um, when he's out there. You know, you want to see an over 50% expected goals when he's on the ice. These are the types of metrics I will be looking for, along with just those counting stats getting elevated over where he was last season. Two other players in Sweden left to talk about and just want to call this out because this is kind of important and may explain kind of where each of them are at presently. So these are two players that are presently 19 years old that are soon to be 20. Both of these players spent the majority of their year in 2022-23 in the under 20 ranks in Sweden. Now, the way that Sweden's uh, J20 national works is 20 year old players can play. They, uh, teams can ice a roster with two 20 year old uh, skaters in every game. And one of their goaltenders can be also 20 years of age, but those 20 year old players cannot play in the playoffs. So Gustav Carlson, who was a sixth rounder in 2022 and Joel Radkovich Bernson, who was a seventh rounder in 2022. They're both going to be looking for jobs this year in hockey, all Svenskin and hope to move up to that senior league level, second division in Sweden pro and join Lacassen in that league. Gustav Carlson, who comes from the Airbro system is already there. He has a tryout only though, with the Nebro Vikings of hockey, all Svenskin who are coming up to Sweden second division after years of being in the third division. So Nebro went out, combed all the systems, identified some talent, maybe found some junior guys like Gustav Carlson, who maybe had some barriers of entry to the top club in the SHL. So they gave him a tryout through September. It's a very short window. He has basically four weeks in this tryout to prove that he belongs at that second pro level. If not, he likely bounces back to Airbro and would be one of those um, 20-year-olds who's playing you know, nightly on the junior roster. But as far as, I don't know how it's going to go with Carlson this year, if he's going to be able to stick or not. We saw him start the preseason as the first line center, second preseason game comes. And they, again, throwing out different line combinations. They put him on a bottom half of the roster line, um, was given a rest game and then came out today on Friday, September 1st, and was a third liner. So they're giving him looks. It seems like he's in the mix. Um, you know, I think he'll have every opportunity through this tryout period in the month of September to prove that he belongs here. But, you know, if he goes back to juniors, I, I you know, it's fine. Um, it's not ideal. I think the Sabres want all of their prospects playing against the highest level of competition they could possibly play against. And for Carlson, it looks like that pathway would be in hockey else. Venskin. Um, he did get nine SHL games last year, picked up an assist, didn't get a lot of ice time in those nine games. Um, played 43 games with Air Bros under 20 squad, 14 goals, 33 points. The, the type of player that he is, you know, he's a good shooter, enters the corners with a lot of speed to win pucks, um, does a lot of damage on the power play at the under 20 level, as you can imagine, but a very gifted playmaker. He's got good size. Um, Want to see him more and kind of see how his physical maturation has come to life. Um, you know, I thought he looked to have good size when he was here over the summer development camp, but I want to see how he matches up against some of these, uh, professional players in hockey, all Svenskin, and we'll get to do that in about a week's time. I'll have the opportunity to take in some of his gains and we will report back on that here on prospect Avenue in future episodes. Carlson is one of those two 19s soon to be twenties that are in that, you know, under 20 hockey, all Svenskin bucket. The other one is Joel Radkovich Bernson. I like Joel Radkovich Bernson. He's a he's got a goal scoring profile to him. He's a good skater, gets up and down the ice really well. I mean, this was a player last year with Frolunda. You know, he had 20 goals in 34 games at the junior level last year. Shooter's profile. You know, he looks the part of a guy that scored 20 goals in 34 games. We saw him take over games at times at that level, almost like it was child's play take the puck from behind his net, just breeze down the wing, go and roof a puck over the goalie's shoulders, made it look easy. A player like that you think would be an attractive skill set to a hockey all Svenskins club. But it's September 1st, and we don't know where Ratkovich Bernson's going to play this year. I had some bad information 
Um, I thought that he had re-upped with Frolunda, and that does not appear to be the case. So it's a wait and see game right now with Radkovich Bernson. I do believe he'll land in hockey else Venskin, but I wanted to kind of offer a little color into why, um, likely why he's not with the Frolunda system at this point. There's what Frolunda's doing right now that, you know, they're always a, a class organization and always competitive. They're in a rebuild mode right now. Um, they're changing out eight players from last year's roster. They're changing out a lot of offense. Um, 35 year old Joel Lundquist is retired. They moved on from Ryan Lash, who was an offensive, you know, uh, definitely an offensive player. We, we saw him play against Oslin and Vekwa yesterday with uh, Lash now moving on to the Lati Pelicans in Liga. Ferlanda also moved on from Louis Erickson, who NHL fans are very well aware of. A lot of offense left the system, and it's going to be an opportunity for a lot of these young players. I think that's the issue. A lot of young players is the issue that Rakovich Bernson had, because if you look at Frolunda and his peer group, I mean, you're looking at names like Otto Stenberg, Isak Bourne, David Edstrom, Noah Hassa, Noah Dyer Nielsen is in that group. Theodore Forsander is another talented young forward that's in that group. They're all in that 19, 20, 21 year old range. And I think that just, you know, those guys are going to have a lot of opportunity. And it was just a lot of traffic for Rakovich Bernson, as talented as he is to cut through. So I think he's elected to look outside of Forlunda and he's yet to latch on. I'm checking like every day, man, to see where he's playing. Um, but no news yet. Um, I, I hope to know quickly for his sake. I hope to find out quickly where he's playing. But just like we talk about with Gustav Carlson and now he's progressing with the Nebro Vikings, we will be quick to report it here and give you some insight and what the, what the outlook looks like for him. Um, but again, you know, he had... Um, four games on loan from for under 20 club last year, where he went up and played for Ostershund and he didn't look out of place. This is not a player. I see having to settle for a third division job. It's just a matter of time before he latches on in hockey else, Venskin. And I'm really curious to see where that is. With that said, just two more players to go here on this Friday. So great to be back with you here on prospect Avenue. Thanks for sticking with me while I was out enjoying summer. We're going to close it up by talking about these last two, and we're going to go back to Finland with Viljami Mariala for TPS Turku. If you remember an earlier summer podcast, one of the videos that are out there on YouTube, um, talked a little bit about how Mariala sets up to be a compelling storyline this year. Um, I believe he has aspirations to come and have a North American career. I mean, this was a guy who came from Finland over to the QMJHL played for the Quebec Remparts for two seasons before bouncing back to TPS last year. And when he bounced back to TPS at the junior level last year, he was dominant, a dominant playmaker, a very excellent goal scorer. He was just firing on all cylinders at that under 20 level in Finland. Earned a call up to TPS late in the year last year, played 15 games, picked up four goals and nine total points. And I like the way that he did that. Um, he was skating hard in straight lines, keeping a stick on the ice, going to the post, finishing off plays. Um, he earned some power play time. He was really moving. He was winning board battles. He was working for what he got last year when he went up to Liga. And I think that's really served him well as he's returned this year. He proved to himself that he could excel at that level. I think he knew that he could always play at that level, but he proved that he could excel at that level late last season. And he came in with a lot of confidence this year. This is a player that looked really good in development camp as well, especially in the three on three scrimmage to close out development camp. So all things considered, he comes into the season, he looks good. And I think the outlook for him is kind of to be determined whether he's their second line center with veteran line mates or a third line center with some younger line mates, we've seen, we've seen a mixed bag. He's had three different sets of, of wingers in the four games that he's played thus far. Um, you know, he did a little bit early with, um, Marcus Nermi, who is a big power forward, six foot five. You know, this was a guy that we saw in the AHL recently playing for the Milwaukee Admirals is a big power forward, big presence around the net. <clears throat> um, we also saw him op opposite Nermi was um, Jesper Linston, who is a 29-year-old veteran playmaker. Again, I like Mariala getting looks with these guys because if that's kind of who he rolls with in the regular season, 
it can only elevate his ice time because I think the coaching staff would be more trustworthy of putting that three man unit out there in some key situations late in games and get some defensive zone starts and just be trusted more. And I think it would just make playing with those guys would also make Mariala just a better player as well. Just playing with more seasoned veteran players, but we have seen Mariala play two games this preseason as part of a very young group uh, with a 21 year old winger named Billy monkey and a New York Rangers fourth round draft pick from 2020, uh, 2021 uh, Kali Vicenin. That would be a very young line. And while fun to watch, I mean, certainly um, an opportunity to create plays and just they're, they're, that unit could be very fun to watch for sure. And both of those wingers have, um, you know, experience playing in Liga last year. So it's not like they're all noobs that would be playing with Mariala. I just have a preference to see him play with more veteran talent. Again, to have more um, developmental opportunities and clutch situations and see how he handles pressure late in games on a team that's expected to be fairly competitive. TPS coming into the league season this year, plus 1000. That's kind of right in the middle of the pack in terms of, um, Liga, it's there. They'd be sixth out of the 15 teams on the odd board. So we'll see what happens with Mariala. But I think that, you know, with a big season, he's one of those guys in that never say never mold where um, he could firm up his his spot on the radar to get a contract offer and get his tukus back to North America to continue his hockey career with Rochester in the American Hockey League. Last but certainly not least, and it's kind of funny to say that, I guess, because Jakob Konechny was the second to last player taken in the 2020 draft, uh, 216th overall in the seventh round. But yes, Jakob Konechny returning this year to Sparta Prague in the Czech Extra Liga. Prague, a perennial front runner in that league this year. They're plus 350, depending on the book you look at. They're either first or second on the odds board. And very similar to pull top off and his situation, you know, being a young player on a veteran team uh, filled with forward talent. That's kind of how Konechny is with Sparta Prague. He's a young player, the youngest player, I believe on their roster um, on a team that averages 28 years of age. So last season, Konechny uh, five goals and 11 points in 45 games, but went through these chunks of time where he went quiet and, wouldn't disappear necessarily from the ice, but just went quiet with an ability to consistently put up points. And last year, you know, he did um, bounce down on a couple of occasions to Sokolov in the second division in Czech, Czechia. So this year, I think the mission for him is just stay on the team all year and work his way up the lineup. This is a, he's talented. He's got good speed burst, especially when he gets a puck on a stick. Konechny is fun to watch because he has an extra gear. Um, I think for him, it's just, be more reliable off the puck, be more consistent, limit those stretches of games where he's not uh, producing or contributing off the puck. Um, Cause I think for him, it's just all about again, consistency. This is a player though. He has so much fun playing the sport. I love watching him play. Always has a smile on his face. This guy scored probably the goal of the year for Sabres prospects last season I should dial it up, but I, I'm not that uh, nimble where I could dig it out of my hard drive right now and, and put it up on the screen. But, you know, race, use that speed burst to race behind the D and get a breakaway and flip a, a one-handed, elevated the puck with one hand and, and scored a goal. And the, and the celebration was great to see. Um, just a really fun player to watch. So, you know, connect me. He, he's just, again, the, the mission there. Stay in the lineup all year. Don't get scratched. Don't get sent down to Sokolov and work your way up the lineup because the talent is certainly there with him. That's it, folks. We are over 40 minutes. I think uh, we did a decent job. Hopefully no uh, egregious errors. I need, um, you know, stat boy. I need the old Tony Reale to go through or, you know, on PTI and like, what do we miss and correct the errors? Um, hopefully we didn't make any today. I am rusty. I am reprogramming my brain for hockey season. Um, coming up prospects, uh, you know, the prospect challenge on September 15th, I will be with Dan Dunleavy and Rob Ray at center ice offering color commentary on the Sabres stream for those Sabres games, Friday, Saturday, and Monday. So I better get my acting gear and be ready to go for that. Cause that's always fun to be there with Dan and Rob. I appreciate the opportunity that they gave me to join them in the booth. And I'm really looking forward to it. Just like I'm looking forward to doing this podcast every week. Thanks for stopping by Prospect Avenue. I'm Chris Baker.
and we'll see you next time.